there is something terrifying about how some towns and villages have simply disappeared from the face of Earth over time. Thinking about them, you will inevitably begin to reflect on the frailty of life. Who destroyed them, man himself or nature? Residents of these places are sure that everyone who hears the bells of the ancient church should clean up and confess. The bells foretell death. I heard this legend quite recently when I was looking for information about the Christmas rituals of Italy. What interested me was this. The history of Krampus goes back to the distant 6th century between the 500th and 600th years of our era. In the Alps, children caroling during Advent, mainly on the Feast of Ste. Nicholas. A long time ago, the good Bishop of Mira distributed bags of gold to poor children. These children also went. They dressed up in warm, cheap fur coats and put on scary masks. Residents gave them sweets and congratulated them on the upcoming Christmas. Yes, only the devil got tangled up between them. A mess, the saint decided. He quickly figured out the unclean by the hooves and forced him to serve for the good of the motherland. Now the demobilized Krampus participates in the celebration. Officially, the saint goes ahead, distributes sweets and gingerbread to good children and the goat-horned one closes the procession, distributing nuts to the disobedient. Krampus comes from the word dead, decomposed. Advent is the four weeks preceding Christmas. Festive processions on the 5th of December. This holiday is already spring. The night action takes place on the first Sunday of Lent. Banishing shadows, purifying and summoning spring. At sunset, the procession begins with songs and prayers. Then the young man spins and throws burning discs. Then they light a specially built bonfire with a scarecrow or a cross on top. I have already spoken about folk beliefs and what really happened here. And there was also the town of Curin in the Tyrolean Alps, on the border of Italy and Switzerland. After the Second World War, they decided to build power plants and much more. According to the project, the old settlement was demolished without much apology, promising to build new housing with an improved layout higher up the slope. It turned out, as always, they promised one thing, gave another. The inhabitants of the mountains, people who were not inclined to cheerful indifference, immediately tied the old legend of the death bells to the preserved bell tower. In the 2010th year, there was a drought here. Of course, these events are not related to each other. Drought is not a rare phenomenon for these places, although it is not annual. This climatic phenomenon was once called El Nino. It is associated with the change in the temperature of the water in the Pacific Ocean, which rises especially strongly in coastal zones. Moreover, it affects different regions in different ways. El Nino simultaneously causes, say, drought in Venezuela and snowfall in Peru. During the period we are talking about, El Nino began to manifest itself in the summer of the 2009th year, and approximately in February of the 10th year, its peak came. It was during this period that the reservoir dried up, at the bottom of which the city of Potosi was located and flooded in the 85th year. The area of Urubandi Kaparo, this is the name of this artificial reservoir in honor of the dammed Urubandi River is about 20 square kilometers. Several rivers flow into the artificial lake, and the dam itself was built to operate a relatively small hydroelectric power station. However, this hydroelectric power plant provides electricity not only to the state of Tachira, in which the station itself and the flooded city are located, but also to several nearby states of the country. Nevertheless, the city, in which about 1,200 people lived, had to be sacrificed. The state energy company, which was engaged in the construction of hydroelectric power plants, but new housing for all residents of Potosi. The last person left the city in the 85th year, when the reservoir was already beginning to fill, the construction of the dam was completed in the 84th year. They write that Carlos Perez, 
who then held the post of president of the country, personally came to inform the residents of Potosi about the fate prepared for their city. Please note that this city cannot be called old. It was founded in the middle of the 19th century, and the inhabitants were mainly engaged in agriculture, not counting those who worked in the hospital, school, shops, and, of course, those who served in the local church. It was even considered one of the coffee centers of Venezuela, but, as we can see, it did not help. Perhaps they would have forgotten about the city that went to the bottom. You never know how many settlements were flooded around the world during the construction of the next dams and reservoirs. However, Potosi did not let himself be forgotten. All this time a cross towered above the water, left on the church, whose height, together with the spire, is about 27 meters. Why were city buildings not destroyed before the flood? Apparently, initially there was no question of navigation, so no one saw any particular risk that the buildings would remain underwater. And for 30 years of being underwater, almost all the buildings collapsed themselves. Only the church with the cross on the spire miraculously remained standing. Sometimes, when the water level dropped, a part of the spire was shown and sometimes the top of the building itself when more, when less. And only in the 2010th year Urbanti Caparo became shallow. The water level dropped by 30 meters and the valley was exposed. It turned out that only the facade, the tower with the cross and the skeleton of the walls remained of the church building. Well, there's not much left of the central square and the local cemetery. The history of the drowned church of Potosi has become famous, so this place has become quite popular among tourists. Actually, the local authorities themselves helped to raise the popularity of Potosi by publishing photos of the old town before its flooding and offering to come and see how it looks now. It is not entirely clear whether the church was flooded again, if so, then not for long. Judging by the dates of the appearance of photos and reviews on various internet sites, over the past few years everything there is quite accessible for inspection. In March of this year, the governor of Tachira State personally visited the hydroelectric power plant, concerned about failures in its operation and he also confirmed that the reservoir was so shallow that it was possible to bypass the church. Illustrating the scale of the problem with the hydroelectric power plant, the news of his visit ends with the fact that the authorities will be engaged in minimizing the effects of drought, which affects the distribution of electricity in the state. Does this mean that Potosi will be flooded again? Definitely. The same El Nino, which we talked about at the very beginning, is not a consequence of any global warming. Its manifestations have been recorded since at least the end of the 18th century, and nothing much has changed during this time. And this means that the prolonged drought will pass after a while, the rivers will fill the artificial lake Urbendi Caparo again, and only the cross over the water will still remind of the flooded city. And maybe there won't be a cross anymore. In the Chinese province of Zhejiang, about 150 kilometers from the city of Hangzhou, there is a beautiful Lake Qian Daoyu, or Lake of a Thousand Islands. This stunning beauty is by no means the creation of the Creator, but the work of human hands. Just six decades ago, the valley was flooded in order to build a hydroelectric power plant. As a result, a little more than a thousand islets were formed from which the lake got its romantic name. But the most interesting thing about this beautiful place is not what is at the top, but what the depths of the lake hide. After all, the Chinese authorities buried two magnificent ancient cities underwater, thereby turning them into a mysterious underwater kingdom. Qian Daoyu Lake is famous for its crystal clear water. It is used to produce the famous brand of mineral water Nomfa Spring. The most beautiful dance forests grow on exotic islands. This is a popular tourist destination where each island has its own theme. There is an island of monkeys, an island of birds, an island of snakes, an island of castles and even an island of childhood. Despite all this, the most interesting things are capped here by the mysterious water depths. 
Before the appearance of the artificial lake, two beautiful ancient cities, Shi Chen and Yi Chen, were located here, at the foot of Ushi Mountain, the mountain of five lions. Shi Chen City was built more than 1,300 years ago, in the 621st year during the reign of the Tang Dynasty. Once it was a powerful city, a political, economic, and cultural center. He Chen is even older. It was founded during the Han Dynasty in the 218th century. It was a business center on the Xinjiang River. These ancient cities, which preserved the history of the former civilization, were flooded in September of the 59th year. The Chinese government has decided that a new hydroelectric power station and a reservoir will be built here. This was required by the needs of the ever-growing population of Hangzhou City. Along with historical values that defy any assessment, almost 30 more cities, more than a thousand villages and tens of thousands of hectares of agricultural land were flooded. To implement this project, the authorities have resettled a little less than 300,000 people whose families have lived in these places for centuries. The complete indifference of the Chinese government to the preservation of ancient cities is simply shocking. The history of the sinking was forgotten for 40 years until the local tourism official Qiu Feng remembered them, looking for ways to attract tourists to Qian Daoyu Lake. He asked the divers to dive under the water and see what was there. In September 2000 of the first year, after trying to get to the flooded city, the official said, we were lucky. As soon as we dive into the lake, we found the outer wall of the city and even lifted a brick. Q immediately informed the government of his discovery. Since many studies have been conducted, experts have concluded that the entire city, which has been underwater for several decades, has not been affected at all. Even the wooden beams and stairs remained intact. After almost 10 years of research, in the 2011th year, the ancient cities were finally appreciated as important historical relics. National Geographic magazine published photos of the magnificent city and called it Chinese Atlantis. It was like an incredibly beautiful underwater fairy tale. It was proposed to open cities to tourists. For this purpose, a special submarine was built for 48 places for walking underwater. But the government has not yet decided how to regulate the use of a private submarine in accordance with the law. In addition, such a device can cause strong undercurrents that can damage ancient buildings. The submarine was never destined to be used. Some experts have suggested building a protective wall under the water and pumping water out of the city. But this method turned out to be too time-consuming and expensive and the walls may not withstand the pressure and collapse. Other experts believe that the best thing right now is to do nothing, because technology is very limited. The authorities took serious care of the preservation of historical monuments and began to take measures. Before using our cultural relics, we have to protect them, said Fen Menghua, former director of the Chunin County Heritage Office. He also noted that currently the level of technology development does not offer reasonable options. Researchers and experts are alarmed by the fact that those parts of the city that rise from their underwater graves and are exposed to the air are destroyed almost instantly. Water has become the best protection for these historical values. In addition, the walls of the city are quite thin and there is a very real danger of their damage due to water flows. To preserve the relic, the authorities proposed to ban sailing, fishing and digging sand in nearby areas of the lake. In the meantime, this place, which bore the proud name Lion City, is a kind of diving Mecca. Archaeologists are also very interested in preserving this stunning city, which preserves such a rich and ancient history. Back at the end of the 2002nd year, the Institute of Mechanics of the Chinese Academy of Sciences proposed to build the Archimedes Bridge, also known as the Suspension Tunnel. Archimedes Bridge is a very complex project. Currently, seven countries are conducting research on this issue. Several proposals have been put forward. Among them are Norway, Japan, Switzerland, Brazil and the USA. 
If the construction of the Archimedes Bridge across Kian Dao Lake is successful, it will be the first real Archimedes Bridge in the world. Meanwhile, the mysterious underwater world of slightly creepy dead cities is not available for public viewing. Its ancient and tragic history beckons and intrigues. Pevlapetri is the oldest sunken city discovered off the southern coast of Laconia, in Alaphonisi, on the underwater section between Punter Beach and Pevlapetri Island, from which it got its name. In 1904, the geologist, president of the Athenian Academy Phokian Nagri, after conducting research in southern Laconia, informed the Greek government about the existence of the ancient city, indicating its location. In the 67th year, oceanographer Nick Fleming from the University of Southampton, conducting research on sea level changes, discovered the city of Pavlopetri at a depth of 3 to 4 meters. In the 68th year, Nick Fleming returned to Pavlopetri with a group of young archaeologists from the University of Cambridge. Then the first maps and descriptions of a rare prehistoric city with a residential project of buildings streets and squares were compiled. Fifteen separate buildings with five streets, a cemetery and individual burials were examined. Many household items and tools, animal figurines, and a bronze female statuette were also found. According to research by the University of Cambridge, the ancient city was first inhabited in 2800 BC while the buildings and streets belong to the Mycenaean period from the 17th to the 2nd century BC. However, later evidence was found indicating that Pevlopetri had been inhabited since the 4th century BC. Let's find out a little more about this place. Despite the fact that Pevlopetri was discovered in the 67th year, the Greek government recently stated that the ceramic element found, which is still 5,000 years old, suggests that the city is much older than originally thought. Moreover, the government also made public the fact that 9,000 square meters of buildings, streets, and graves were discovered, as well as ruins similar to a large building for celebrations. This suggests that Pevlopetri may have been an important port city, and the find is also an important source of information about the life of Neolithic people. Ruins of huts and Paleolithic caves were found on the seabed, but not cities with streets and rows of houses with walls, says Nick Flaming, a specialist at the National Oceanographic Center in Southampton, Great Britain, who was one of the first to discover Pevlopetri in the 60s and dated its existence to 1,500 year BC. We found that Pevlopetri is two or three thousand years older than any other previously found sunken city. Its uniqueness also lies in the fact that it was a port. Although settlements of this age have been found on Earth, the discovery of such an ancient existence of life on the seabed was recorded for the first time. It was a very large city with large reserves of copper mines and settlements in the highlands. Fleming notes. The city was a crossroads for seafarers, a transport hub between the mainland and the island of Crete, as well as a rich agricultural area. It's very interesting in terms of what was happening at that time. Once we start excavating this site, we will be able to learn a lot about how the Bronze Age city lived. As expected, Pevlopetri suffered from numerous earthquakes, as a result of which it was flooded. This is a rare and significant find as it represents a frozen moment of the past. At the end of the 17th century, Port Royal in Jamaica was the pirate capital of the entire Atlantic. But in 1692, this city almost completely sank to the seabed along with all its riches as a result of a powerful earthquake and tsunami. And the riches in the pirate capital were serious. It was not for nothing that the city was considered the richest colonial center of the entire British Empire. Port Royal is the most famous pirate capital in history. And although it was the official capital of the British administration of Jamaica, nevertheless, the pirates felt at home here. The fact is that according to the agreement with the British authorities, 
pirates were forbidden to touch British merchant ships and ships of states allied with Great Britain. Thus, the pirates' main source of income was a tax on Spanish galleons and even cities in Spanish America. But it was quite a lot, considering that the Spanish booty was much richer than the cargoes of ordinary neutral merchants. The city of Port Royal was founded on the site of a Spanish military camp, more precisely, Fort Cagway. In fact, Jamaica was discovered by Columbus in 1494 and the Spaniards who arrived after him found wonderful places here to create sugar cane and cocoa plantations. However, there were problems with the labor force because the Indians who inhabited the island did not want to work. They had to get rid of them all and get the slaves out of Africa. In general, more than 50,000 Indians were destroyed in a hundred years and the Spanish grandees with their black slaves firmly settled on the island. However, a little more than a century and a half has passed, and new predators have appeared in the Caribbean, the British. They captured Jamaica in 1655 and built their naval base Port Royal on the site of Fort Kegway. Jamaica occupied an excellent strategic position in the entire region and therefore the British began to seek official recognition of their possession of the island from Spain. As a result, the Spaniards gave up and stopped claiming Jamaica, which they later regretted very much. Along with merchants and the military, Port Royal was flooded with pirates of all stripes, and with a population of almost 10,000 people, almost half of the gentlemen of fortune lived in it. But here it should be said that it was thanks to the pirates that Port Royal began to flourish, and so violently that it outstripped all other British colonial centers of the Atlantic in terms of financial and trade turnover. According to one contemporary, Port Royal had even more gold and diamonds per capita than London. And that means something. Pirates raided the whole of Spanish America, plundered all the Spanish ships they could, and thus a significant part of the Spanish wealth was transported from Jamaica to London, enriching the British treasury. Of the most famous pirates of those times, Henry Morgan can be singled out the richest pirate in history, who was also an official of the British administration, since he held the post of governor of Jamaica for some time. However, the music did not play for long, and in 1092, 36 years after its foundation, the pirate capital was destroyed by a powerful earthquake and then washed into the sea by a huge tsunami wave. And the whole tragedy lasted only a few minutes. More than half of the city's residents and almost 1,800 residential and administrative buildings of the city, out of 2,000, were washed into the sea. Moreover, as a result of the earthquake, most of the land on which the city was located fell into the sea to a depth of 15 to 20 meters. In addition, almost 50 ships sank in the harbor, including several military ones. Given such irreparable destruction, it was decided to move the capital of Jamaica a little further north, to the later built city of Kingston. Port Royal was still being rebuilt on the old site, but it already bore the seal of death. As a result of several hurricanes and fires, it was later completely destroyed, and 30 years after the earthquake, the residents left this place forever. However, Port Royal still attracts treasure hunters, because along with the city, huge riches that were stored by pirates and local bankers went to the bottom of the sea. A lot of gold was found on sunken ships, but for 350 years, during which the search was conducted, treasure hunters managed to find only a few tens of kilograms of Spanish silver and a little gold, and even then by accident. Port Royal does not give its wealth to people, even despite the most modern technologies that are used in the search. But there must be a lot of gold in the sunken city. It just could have been badly dug up, as one of the treasure hunters Robert Marx put it, who managed to find a chest with Spanish coins in Port Royal. True. This treasure hunter has never appeared in Jamaica again, but he has many followers who know how to dig better. In Hindu mythology, Dwarka was the capital of Krishna's kingdom, where the Yadava tribes lived. 
When Krishna decided to leave the former capital Mathura, he ordered the construction of a new city. Dvaraka was built overnight, it lasted about 10,000 years, and seven days after Krishna's death, the city was swallowed up by the sea. Recently, archaeologists have proved that the legend has a historical basis. The remains of an ancient city were discovered at the bottom of the Arabian Sea. Stories about the city, the walls of 900,000 palaces of which were made of silver and decorated with emeralds, were considered a legend until recently. In ancient manuscripts there is such a description of the capital of the Adavas. The new city in the middle of the sea was built very soundly. It had straight roads, wide streets and alleys, as well as wonderful gardens and parks where desire trees grew. The city also had many palaces and gates. Almost all the palaces were of extraordinary height. In each house there were cellars, where there were large gold and silver vessels for storing grain. There were many golden vessels with water in the rooms. The walls of the bedrooms were inlaid with precious stones, and the floors were lined with marcotta gemstone mosaics. The ancient Dwarka was discovered by the Indian archaeologist Dr. Rao. The discovery was so sensational that the sunken city is now called Dr. Rao's Atlantis. Excavations began on land, in the coastal zone on the territory of the modern city of Dwaraka, in the 79th year. The age of the artifacts found at the bottom of the sea dates back to the 1500 year BC. The estimated age of the city varies in different sources from 2 to 30,000 years. The ruins were discovered at a depth of 40 meters underwater in the Bay of Cambay, the bay of the modern city of Dwarka, one of the seven oldest cities in India. Acoustic studies have shown that the city has preserved surprisingly clear geometric shapes. As a result of the excavations, walls, paved roads, and limestone sculptures were found. There were no surviving buildings, but the contours of the development can be traced along the roads. Once the city was so beautiful that in the manuscripts it was called nothing else than a fairy kingdom. Dr. Rao explains the death of the Yadava capital as follows. Apparently, Faraka was covered by a tsunami wave of enormous force, which threw huge stones out of the walls from which they were built. This probably led to the fact that the Gomadi River changed its course, as evidenced by the archaeologist Bora in his report. Geological studies and aerial photography data have confirmed that several thousand years ago, best territories in this area were indeed flooded as a result of a natural disaster. Starting with a tsunami, the elements raged for a very long time, flooding coastal cities, and subsided only in the middle of the second millennium BC. According to legend, Varaka went underwater six times, and the modern Indian city is the seventh built on this territory. Modern Dwaraka is located on the west coast of India, near the Arabian Sea. Currently, excavations are continuing. Now archaeologists are trying to find out if there are even more ancient ruins under the water. The research is complicated by the fact that the Indian government does not consider it necessary to finance them. Festivals in honor of the god Krishna are held annually in the country. So, in honor of his birth, Krishna Janmashtami is celebrated one of the brightest summer festivals in India. It happens that people destroy history with their own hands. Most often, the elements of nature, under the influence of God's providence, take their toll and erase the memory of great peoples and civilizations from the face of the earth.